Hello. Are you guys able to hear me? Can you guys hear me? I just want to make sure everyone can hear me. Okay, <laughs> we have a response. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so today, um, I'm not sure if we're going to take up the whole hour, but we do have to cover some of the things that we were unable to finish last week. Um, it's a smaller group than usual today, which is good. Um, so please, you know, participate. Um, if you don't usually participate since we are a little bit smaller today. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start up by finishing up our slides from chapter 24. There were a couple questions that we needed to kind of finish up on. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. Okay, this is this is the agenda, but we already know what we're doing today. <laughs> okay, so our first questions, these are all true or false statements. Um, so true or false, you can use the catalase test to differentiate between streptococci from staphylococci. True or false? So remember the slide where we had the catalase test and also the coagulase test? So one of those differentiates between strep and staph, and the other one differentiates between staph aureus and other different types of staph. Do you guys remember which one differentiates for which? Okay, I don't have any answers, <laughs> but... So this is true. This one's differentiating between um, streptococci from staphylococci. Let me see if I can pull up this YouTube video. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, so this is about staph. This is basically showing you what the catalase test would look like. So they're utilizing the 3% hydrogen peroxide, placing it on the slide. And there you see the bubbling. <laughs> and then you see, basically they're showing you that they're, the staff is bubbling, right? So there it's catalase positive. All right. So hopefully that will help you guys remember it a little bit, maybe. You can't see any of the slides? Oh, let me try to share this again. Okay, what about now? Can you guys see it now? Okay. Oh my goodness. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> oh, um, you couldn't see the video either, could you? Oh, well, that's unfortunate. Let me put it on double speed. <laughs> I'm so sorry, guys. Okay, so they're basically showing you how to do the the catalase test. So she's touching the center of a colony right now, and if it's catalase positive, you're gonna get the bubbling, right? So you see it's bubbling. So they're asking, is this staph or strep? And it's telling you it, it's staph. So she now touched a strep colony and she's putting it on there and you can see that there are no bubbles. Okay, so hopefully that will help you remember the catalase test. 
OK, so the next question is, gram-positive organisms are generally tested for their ability to ferment the nutrient sugar named lactose. Is that true or false? It's OK to guess. <laughs> Okay, you guys are a bit shy today. Um, so this one's going to be false, right? So gram negatives, they're going to be the ones that you're going to associate with your lactose fermenters, right? And um, one of, you know, when we touch on Enterobacteriaceae, we'll definitely talk a lot more about um, gram negative organisms. So that is not this week's, but the week after. Uh, so just keep that in mind. We'll definitely touch more on it and why it's important in two weeks. And then Pseudomonas species and Proteus species are non-lactose fermenting gram-positive organisms. True or false? Okay, so when you're reading this and I know it's difficult because we haven't really touched on Enterobacteriaceae, not that Pseudomonas or Proteus are, but um, Pseudomonas is a gram-negative organism, so you should already be thinking this has to be a false statement. Okay. All right, so now we have a who am I? So this is a pathogen that we're talking about. So this is a pleomorphic bacteria that lacks a cell wall. It's surrounded by a plasma membrane, and because I lack a rigid cell wall, I am resistant to cell wall active antibiotics like penicillins and cephalosporins. I can grow an artificial media that provides me with sterols, exogenous cholesterol. So when you're reading this, you should be thinking of what in this paragraph is pointing me towards the bacteria. Right, so when you're reading it, I lack a cell wall. So we already know that we're not going to have a gram positive or gram negative organism, right? So what organisms do we know that lack a cell wall? We covered this last week. Michael. Mycoplasma, correct. Yeah, good job, Jacqueline. Very good. Yes, so mycoplasma. So this is part of chapter 24 um, where they had a small paragraph on mycoplasma pneumoniae, but you should already kind of be thinking of the bacteria that lack a cell wall, your acid fast bacteria, right? So your mycoplasma, uh, mycobacterium, um, all of those lack cell wall, okay? Next question for chapter 24. So guidelines for transporting specimens include, one, deliver the specimen promptly to the laboratory, two, transport in leak-proof specimens, containers, and sealable leak-proof bags, three, transport specimens in the syringe used to collect it, and four, refrigerate all specimens prior to transport. Oh, very good. You're all getting C. Okay, so this is a concept that you're familiar with. I'm very happy to see that. So for those previous ones that we weren't having a lot of involvement with, that lets me know that those are some of the, the things that you guys need to go back and review um, from that chapter, from chapter 24, okay? Making sure that you're understanding all of that. So this is a chart, one of the charts in your book which basically tells you the general guidelines for collection of optimum specimens. And this is something that you're going to want to make sure that you know. Um, unfortunately, there's just no other way around it. So we'll go through all of these right now. Um, so one, you want to collect the material from the site in which the etiologic agent will most likely be found. Collect the specimen at the optimum time, so for tuberculosis, right, or acid-fast bacillus, 
early mornings. Obtain cultures prior to the administration of antibiotics whenever possible. Number three, this one right here, this is one that comes up pretty often in practice questions um, when it comes to guidelines for collection of specimens. Uh, also collect an adequate volume of material. Inadequate amounts of specimen may yield false negative results. Collect the specimen in a manner that minimizes or eliminates contamination from indigenous Florida flora <laughs> as possible to ensure that the sample will be representative of the infected site. Number six, use the appropriate collection devices, transport me media, and sterile, and sterile leak-proof containers. Seven, use sterile equipment and aseptic technique to collect specimens to prevent introduction of microorganisms during invasive procedures. And let me open my book really quick. I think, I don't want to tell you the wrong chapter, but I think it's in the 20s. Oh, no, it's chapter 30. So chapter 30 goes over aseptic technique. That's definitely one of the chapters that you're going to want to make sure that you review. It's part of our of our of our assigned readings, um, but not for this module. But that's an important chapter. Okay. Um, number eight, clearly label the specimen, including specific information regarding the site of collection and complete the ordering process. Number nine, identify the specimen source and or specific site correctly so that proper processing methods and culture media will be selected, selected by the laboratory personnel. Number 10, if the specimen is collected through intact skin, cleanse the skin first with 70% alcohol and iodine solution or chlorhexidine slash alcohol combination. If iodine is used, remove excess iodine after the specimen has been collected. Also, make sure you provide clear instructions to patients if they are collecting their own specimen, like a clean catch, urine, or stool, and in, in order to obtain the best quality specimen and allay their fears. 12, deliver the specimen promptly to the laboratory. Delay in transport may compromise the specimen. Um, so how long do you have to deliver cerebrospinal fluid to the lab once it's collected? One hour, correct, yes. Uh, as with all patient contact episodes, consistent attention must be given to hand hygiene and use of appropriate personnel, protective equipment, um, and use appropriate safety devices. Me, me, me. Okay. That one is pretty self-explanatory. Okay, so let's talk about you're unable to get the specimen to the lab right away. And so you need to decide whether to refrigerate or let the specimen stay out in like at room temp. So the first specimen is going to be urine. Can you refrigerate it or does it have to stay out at room temp? Oh, we have some uh, some answers that are disagreeing with each other. <laughs> so some of you said refrigerate, refrigerate, and some of you said room temperature. Got to refrigerate this one. Can anyone tell me what this one is? This picture. So it's CSF. Yes, Terry, good job. So CSF. What about it? Can it stay out in room temperature or do you need to refrigerate it? Mm, okay, everyone's everyone's got this one. <laughs> get it to the lab. Yes, you want to get it to the lab, but just in case, you want to leave it at room temp. You don't want to toss it in the fridge. Okay, the next one is a stool sample. Refrigerate or room temp? Us epis know this. Good job. Okay, what about sputum? What do you want to do with that one? Okay, so we have some conflicting answers again. So you want to refrigerate. Okay, what about um, a genital specimen? Room temperature or refrigerate? Okay, you guys need to review this stuff. We have a room temp. We're getting a lot of different answers. So this will be a good slide for you guys to make um, cards out of so that you can remember. And what about eye? Any specimens collected from the eyes? Room temp or refrigerate? 
room temp. Okay, the majority are, of you are saying it right. All right. Okay, next question. A microbe that can grow in the absence of oxygen but is also able to utilize oxygen for growth is a aerobe, obligate anaerobe, facultative anaerobe, or microaerophilic anaerobe. Right, and so if you're taking your test, let's see if I can uh, draw something here. Oh, it's not letting me draw. Okay, well, if you were to basically, you know, draw out a little stool, or, I'm sorry, draw out a little tube, right, when you're taking this, this test, it's telling you that it's able to grow in the absence of oxygen, so you have some microbes growing down towards the bottom of the tube, but it's also able to grow in the presence of oxygen, so you're gonna have some growing towards the top of the tube. And if you guys remember, that was what our facultative anaerobe um, looked like, right? Okay. So next. A gram scene shows clusters of gram-positive cocci. The most likely pathogen is, so this comes back to making sure that you know what the names signify. So which one of these doesn't, what beginning part of the word means clusters? Mm hmm okay you guys all got this one correct okay what about strep what does strep mean what does that root right here strep mean when you see strep what, is, what does that make you think of if staff makes you think of clusters strep makes you think of chains correct okay good job now let's get into chapter 25. All right, so this is this is gonna, this is something that's going to be more touched upon in chapter 13. So I'm kind of just doing the introduction right now, but this is something that you're definitely going to be tested on. Um, this is something that is really kind of sprinkled throughout the test, and they'll find different ways to kind of ask you about sensitivity and specificity. So it's important for you to make sure that you really are able to differentiate between the two because you don't want to get confused when you're taking the exam. You don't want to kind of study this in a way that it's not clear because they're going to not make it as easy <laughs> as, you know, or as straightforward as some of our public health classes were. And so you just want to make sure that you're reading this and reviewing it, but they'll there will be a more thorough chapter that discusses sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is the ability of a test to detect all true cases of the disease or the absence of a false negative result. So you have the number of true positive results over the number of true positive plus false negative results, right? And so there's there's a chart or a square that we can utilize to kind of simplify this, but I'm saving that for chapter for the chapter 13 this um, PowerPoint. And specificity describes the ability of a test to correctly identify a negative result. So the number of true negative results plus the false positive results, right? Okay, so let's do a concept check. Which of the following statements are true of tests with a higher sensitivity than specificity? I'm not going to read them because I don't want to confuse you guys. So just kind of read over the question and think about it. And then let me know what you guys think the answer is. Okay, so we have some Bs, a C, and 
The answer is B. So sensitivity and specificity are terms used to evaluate a clinical test. Sensitivity is the proportion of patients with a disease who test positive. Specificity is the proportion of patients without the disease who test negative. The sensitivity and specificity of a quantitative test are dependent on the cutoff value above or below which the test is positive. In general, the higher the sensitivity, the lower the specificity and vice versa. A test with high sensitivity but low specificity results in many patients who are disease-free being told of the possibility that they have the disease and are then subject to further investigation. And that's the explanation for this. This was one of the questions that you had on your practice one exam. And that's the explanation for it, okay? Okay, so next let's talk about lumbar punctures, right? So if someone's coming to the emergency department or, you know, if they're in the, whatever it may be, let's do ED because that's what I'm most familiar with. If someone's coming to the emergency department and the physician or the mid-level is considering conducting a lumbar puncture, what are they concerned with? What is in the differential at that point when you're considering doing a lumbar puncture? There's a variety of different things that you're thinking, right, when someone's presenting. One of them is on the reportable disease list. Okay, encephalitis, right? What else? This is a this is more of a clinical question, right? And like I've told you guys, some of the clinical aspects of the test are going to be a little bit harder for those of us who are in public health because we're not exposed to it all the time. Meningitis, okay. Right. Okay, so we're not getting a lot of um, answers right now, but when you're when someone's presenting to the ED and you're considering doing a lumbar puncture, there's a variety of reasons, or or it depends really on their clinical presentation. But you're typically looking at some type of viral or bacterial infection, um, like meningitis or encephalitis, tumors or cancers of the of the nervous system, uh, bleeding like hemorrhaging around the brain or spinal cord, or you could do multiple sclerosis. Right now, when it comes to the exam. There are four basic components that are considered when you're analyzing cerebrospinal fluid. And these are these are things that you absolutely need to know. Um, there's a lot of different things in chapter 25, and I know it seems like cerebrospinal fluid is a small portion of the test, but you will get questions on CSF. And the four different things that you need to keep in mind when you're studying are going to be the color and clarity, protein, the protein values, glucose, the white blood cells, including their differentials, right? So these four things, these four components, are what you need to keep in mind when you're being asked questions about CSF on the CIC exam. In the APIC text, they break it down like this in uh, Table 25.3 and uh, Chapter 25. So they have the color clarity, the protein, the glucose, the white blood cell count, and the white blood cell differential, right? and they have it for adult, for neonates. And then here you have the bacterial infection, the viral infection, and a fungal infection. So there's gonna be a lot of um, accessibility to different types of charts and um, explanations online, whether it's YouTube, but I would really suggest that you stick to what's on the APIC text because this is what they're utilizing to test you on. So, <laughs> So try to use their charts and their resources for, for memorizing some of these values or what the CSF will look like rather than other resources because this is where they're getting the information from, right? So for a bacterial infection, the clarity is going to be cloudy, protein is going to be elevated, glucose is going to be decreased, agglutinating capacity increase, and then you have here the what the differential will look like, right? And then for a viral infection, it's clear or hazy, normal to um, increased, and so basically this is what they're going to they're going to test you on and they're going to tell you basically Susie Joe came, you know, to the your facility and her CSF looks like 
X, Y, and Z. This is what's going on with her CSF. What are you thinking? Is this a viral infection? Is this a bacterial infection? Or is this a fungal infection? And that's where knowing these values is going to be really helpful. This is an example of what one of those charts would look like that you can find online for different types for the condition like acute bacterial meningitis, uh, a cerebral hemorrhage, Guillain-Barre syndrome, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord tumor, tumor or viral infections. And so as you can see here, like they have, they're basically telling you essentially the same thing, but once again, I would recommend that you memorize the ones from the APIC text rather than finding other resources. It's not bad to, to listen to other lectures or to read other things to solidify and to better understand the concept, but, but as far as like for your actual, actual exam, I would really suggest you use the APIC text. Okay. So question one, a nurse is concerned that she has been exposed to a patient with possible meningitis because she assisted with the patient's lumbar puncture in the ED and did not wear a mask. The patient's CSF gram stain shows gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. Does the nurse need to receive post-exposure prophylaxis? Yes, she should receive uh, post-exposure prophylaxis because the gram stain is indicative of listeria monocytogenes. No, she does not need uh, PEP because the gram stain is indicative of fungal meningitis. No, she does not need PEP because the gram stain is indicative of streptococcus pneumoniae. And yes, she should receive PEP because the gram stain is indicative of Neisseria meningitidis. So as you are reading this, you need to start thinking of answers that you can cancel out, right? So let me give you guys a second to read through that again. So we have some A's, we have a lot of C's, right? Okay, so let's start canceling out. Yes, she should receive PEP because the gram stain is indicative of Neisseria meningitidis. Is Neisseria meningitidis a gram positive organism or a gram negative organism? There's a whole chapter on Neisseria, but it's better that you start getting uh, accustomed to me asking you questions like this now. <laughs> Gram negative, correct. Good job, Terry. All right. No, she does not need PEP because the gram stain is indicative of fungal meningitis. Is can you do a gram positive or gram negative stain on on a fungus? Okay, so we have already crossed out B and D, and it's coming back to A or C. The patient CSF gram stain shows gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. What does strep mean again? Chains, correct. So that alone should be leading you to this answer, right? To answer C. So I know sometimes I'm giving you kind of test taking strategies, but it's because I want you to be successful on this exam and I want you to start getting used to asking yourself, number one, what do I know? And number two, what is the trap? What is the trick? What are they trying to, to test my knowledge on, right? You know, you didn't even necessarily like, yeah, sure, the scenario is great, but there was a lot of fluff around that question to get down to the bottom of what it really is. Gram positive cocci in pairs and chains. That's really what you needed to focus on in that question. So start getting used to really narrowing in on what they want. Okay, so for this question, uh, the explanation is meningitis is most commonly caused by streptococcus pneumoniae in the U.S. A gram stain result of gram positive cocci in pairs and chains indicates streptococcus species in the CSF. Okay, meningitis caused by streptococcus pneumoniae is not communicable, so the nurse does not need PEP in this case. However, given the suspicion of meningitis, she should have followed droplet precautions while assisting with the lumbar puncture. So that is what I call APIC being shady, right? They're basically telling this nurse, you shouldn't have put yourself in this position anyway to begin with. But yes, that is correct, okay? So next one. 
Which of the following precautions should be used for a patient who is immunocompromised and suspected of having cryptococcal meningitis? A, contact precautions for staff, family, sorry, contact precautions for staff, family restricted from visiting other patients. B, standard precautions for family and staff. C, mask worn when within three feet from bed. D, airborne precautions for 24 hours after antibiotics is started if the patient is improving. Okay, we have some Bs, okay, and an A. Okay, so a mask worn within three feet from a bed. What do we think of when we see this recommendation right here? Droplet, correct. So when a baby is born, right, if to a mom who has influenza, which that's you know that's sad if you are giving birth and you have influenza that's that's rough but one of the one of the things that they have to do is they have to make sure that they're keeping the child at least three feet away from her and that's because of that range of droplets right they're able to travel three to six feet and so you should be thinking you should be thinking flu when you see this type of recommendation or droplet precautions when you see this type of recommendation airborne precautions for 24 hours and after antibiotics is started if the patient is improving that's for a, an airborne disease, right? Is cryptococcal meningitis uh, an airborne disease? Is it bacterial? Is it fungal? Good job, Jacqueline. Yes, it's fungal. So cryptococcosis or cryptococcal disease is a potentially fatal fungal disease caused by one of two species, cryptococcus neoformans and cryptococcus ooh, G A T T I I gadi. Cryptococcal meningitis is believed to result from dissemination of the fungus from either an observed or unappreciated pulmonary infection. Fungal meningitis is not transmitted from person to person and requires the use of standard precautions, right? So for contact precautions, what what do we most commonly like when you think of putting someone on contact precautions, what do you think of? You don't think you don't think of meningitis, you think of Okay, you think of a rash, what else? Enteric illnesses, correct. If you have a, a you know, a wound, a MRSA infection, um, because you're really trying to prevent that direct contact, right? Okay. All right, next question. A 19-year-old female UCF student presents to the ED at ORMC with a high fever and respiratory issues. The patient became hypoxic and required immediate intubation prior to being transferred to the ICU. Her chest x-ray revealed airspace disease, most likely being pneumonia. A bronchoscopy is performed and the gram stain reveals a gram-negative diplococci. The attending calls you to assist both the employees who care for this patient and her contacts. Those in need of in those in need of prophylaxis following this exposure to this patient are A, the ICU and ER staff, the college students in her dormitory and her family, B, no special prophylaxis is needed, C, the EMT who suctioned the patient, the physician who intubated the patient, and the patient's boyfriend, and D, the EMTs, the ER staff on duty, the ICU personnel, and the radiography technician. That's a lot, so let me give you a second to kind of digest that. Okay, I think you guys might be struggling with this one a little bit. Okay, so let's let's break it down, right? There's a lot of fluff here. There's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of things that they're just painting a picture for you, right? And the CIC exam, they love to do that. They love to paint pictures for you. Um, their questions aren't always straightforward. They like to kind of get you lost in in the scenario, in the you know, in the scenario, or like make you get a little bit fuzzy. Like, okay, what is important, right? So 
basically, you're, you have a student that's ill. They have respiratory issues. They're hypoxic. They need intubation. So there's something going on. It's most likely a pneumonia, right? It reveals a gram-negative diplococci. So when you think of a, a gram-negative diplococci, right? What do you what do, what could you possibly be thinking of? And we've already seen this pathogen once in one of our previous slides. Neisseria. Good job. Good job. So you're thinking of Neisseria, right? Now, is Neisseria meningitis something that can be transferred to others? Yes, that's a yes or no question. Yes. Okay, so we know we're kind of narrowing it down. Okay, this is something that can be transferred to others and we need to be concerned. Okay, now who can it be transferred to? Are you are you going to be worried about, you know, the college students in her dormitory if she had Neisseria? Is that something that you're concerned with? So, you know, Terry says no, okay. Um, the EMTs, the ER staff on duty, what the ER staff on duty, so staff who may not have even had contact with the patient, are, are they someone that you're concerned with or who need um, prophylaxis? If you have an entire ED and only two nurses took care of her? Right. So you need to, you know, when you're taking these questions, start crossing some out. Right. So no special prophylaxis is needed. You can already cross out B and you can kind of take out A. And if you read a little bit more into this one, you can take out D. Right. So start doing the elimination process as best as you can with the information that you have. Um, and I'm going to keep drilling into your head the different types of bacteria and what they look like because it's going to be so important for you when you take the exam. So transmission of Neisseria meningitis to healthcare personnel has occurred um, after unprotected exposure. Under, after unprotected exposure to infected patients during endotracheal intubation, airways, airway suctioning, and oxygen administrations. CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices recommends PEP for close contacts of patients with meningococcal disease, right? And this, the definition for a close contact is household members, child care center personnel, persons directly exposed to the patient's oral secretions, like kissing, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, endotracheal intubation, or endotracheal tube management. So is that clear for, is this question kind of clear for everyone? Does anyone have anything that they don't understand about it? Or are we good to move on? Okay, I think we're good. All right, our next question is, a patient CSF analysis demonstrates elevated white blood cells, an increase in protein, and a decrease in glucose. This is what I was telling you. <laughs> this is what I was telling you. This is how they're going to ask you questions, okay? That's, this is exactly the kind of question that they can ask you. Switch those, switch that around, decrease in white blood cells, decrease in protein. That's the kind of question they're going to ask you. So that's why you need to make sure you have that chart memorized. So a patient's CSF analysis demonstrates elevated white blood cells, an increase in protein, and a decrease in glucose. What could it be?
Okay, so our answer is bacterial meningitis. All right, so let's go to chapter 26. So antimicrobial resistance. Antimicrobial use is the main selective pressure responsible for the increasing drug resistance seen in hospitals. To have an impact on antimicrobial use so as to reduce resistance, infection preventionists need a working knowledge of the following right here. So the text is already telling you what you're going to get quizzed on, right? Or what you're going to get tested on. Available antimicrobials, principles for their appropriate use, the mechanisms by which these drugs inhibit microbial growth, and mechanisms by which the organisms develop resistance. So the test alone is already kind of giving you some insight into what you need to read into, into what you need to make notes of. Main, make notes of. And by the you know, the text, the APIC text is telling you, this is what you need to know as an IP. This is what we want you to know. This is what you need to make sure that you review. So some key concepts. More needs to be done to control how antimicrobials are commonly used. Antimicrobial stewardship is the best investment for preventing the proliferation of multidrug resistant organisms. An antibiogram is a useful tool for IPs to determine the status of strategies in place to reduce multidrug resistant organisms. And a multidisciplinary approach is necessary to basically improve antimicrobial stewardship. So the infection control department, the infectious disease department, microbiology and pharmacy, all of these people are really important to actually getting an antimicrobial stewardship program off the ground and to making sure that you are working on this at your facilities. And for us health department people, right, uh, those of us in public health, when we're out and we're conducting infection control assessments, one of the things that we need to make sure we're looking at is are infection control programs and hospitals really having a multidisciplinary approach? Are they having, you know, multidisciplinary rounds where they're going over and looking at, you know, can we de-escalate some of these antibiotics? Can we change from IV to PO, right? So these are the kind of things that we need to keep an eye out for when we're going into these facilities and really making sure that they're having a multidisciplinary approach. Okay, so let's go a little bit about antimicrobials and their mechanisms. So an antimicrobial is a substance that inhibits or kills microbes. Most are administered by intravenous or oral routes. Antimicrobials that actively kill organisms may be bactericidal or fungicidal. Antimicrobials that only arrest the growth of an organism and assist the host in clearing the infection are bacteriostatic or fungus, fung, fungostatic. Right? So that's that's basically saying that that it's arresting the growth and it's letting your immune system do all the work. So you have three types of antimicrobial mechanisms. You have antifungals, antivirals, and antibacterials. So for antifungals, they alter permeability of the fungal membrane and inhibit membrane biosynthesis or DNA synthesis. So for antivirals, they inhibit formation of DNA precursors, DNA polymerase, and HIV reverse transcription. They interfere with viral uncoding or confer viral resistance on uninfected cells. I think antifungals and antivirals, they're important, but if you're on a time crunch, I would definitely say focus on the antibacterials more so than the other two. Um, I feel like the antibacterials, having that those concepts down are a bit more important than the antivirals and antifungals. Um, antibacterials interfere with cell wall biosyntheses, inhibit bacterial ribosomes, and they interfere with DNA replication or RNA transcription, or they inhibit metabolic pathways. So we have basically four different types or four classes that you're going to focus on, which are going to be your beta-lactam drugs, your fluoroquinolones, your macrolides, and your aminoglycosides. So the beta-lactam drugs. Beta-lactam drugs possess bactericidal activity by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. That's going to be your penicillins, cephalosporins, monobactams, and carbapenems. Did any of you guys watch the antimicrobial ladder YouTube video that I sent out? It's okay if you didn't. You can just let me know if you did or you didn't. Okay, one of you did. Not yet. Okay, so I really recommend that you guys watch that video because I feel like it does a really good job of breaking down these antibiotics and helping you organize this in your mind. Um, I don't have a, a clinical background, right? So I'm not a nurse. Um, I, 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 the closest to any type of like clinical activities I've, I've been are being a scribe, right? And so that's where I, I got a lot of my exposure to learning drug names, learning uh, 
the different type of tests that they do in a hospital. But for us in public health, you know, we're not, we're not, most of us are not made to learn um, about drugs or the pharmacology of drugs. And so I feel that that video specifically does a good job at helping us um, public health folks understand it better because you know if you come from a clinical background this stuff is going to come a lot easier to you um, and so we need to play catch up as public health professionals to make sure that we're kind of able to speak that language um, when it comes to medications and pharmacodynamics and all of that fun stuff. Okay, so the beta-lactam drugs, they possess bactericidal activity by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. That's your penicillins, your cephalosporins, your monobactams, and your carbapenems, meropenem, imapenem, all the penems. Okay, next one. Fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones inhibit bacterial enzymes important in DNA replication, and that's going to be your ciprofloxacin, right? Your cipro. Macrolides. Macrolides inhibit protein synthesis and they are mostly bacteriostatic, therefore used for less serious infection. And what does bacteriostatic mean? I want to make sure we're reviewing this as we go. <laughs> arrests growth. Very good. Yes, it arrests growth. They're, therefore, they're used for less serious infections, azithromycin. Okay, what what is one... Uh, what is one infection that you can use azithromycin for? An STD you can use azithromycin for? Chlamydia, very good, very good. Okay, your aminoglycosides. These act at the site of bacterial ribosomes and they're used for combination therapy for serious or multi-drug resistant infections like gentamicin. Um, what about uh, amicacin? Amicacin is also an aminoglycoside. All right, so let's touch a little bit on pharmacodynamic factors. So the minimal inhibitory concentration is the MIC, right? I forgot I forgot whether it was complex or concentration. I should have known it was concentration last week, but now, now we have it clarified, okay? Minimal inhibitory concentration, and that's the lowest concentration of a drug that can inhibit microbial growth. Now, here, it breaks it down a different way than the previous slides where it tells you, you know, what it affects the cell wall, the cell membrane, ribosomes, nucleic acid synthesis, or the metabolic pathway. And the reason why I'm showing you guys this is because if, as you recall from the, from our, our very first slide, they want you to know the available antimicrobials, the principles for their appropriate use, the mechanisms by which these drugs inhibit microbial growth, and the mechanisms by which the organisms develop resistance. Now, this last bullet point we already discussed last week where we had conjugation, um, transformation. So it, basically, like, they, they're, there's a lot of repetition in the APIC text, and as you start reading the chapters, you're going to see it more and more, and you're going to be like, hey, I, we already kind of covered that last week, or we already went over this, and the reason why is because it's important. They want to make sure that you know it. So some side effects of drugs. So you have super infections resulting from the suppression of normal microflora. So we have uh, Clostridium difficile vaginal candidiasis and oral thrush, you have different types of toxicities, right? You have hepatotoxicity, which is the elevation of liver enzymes, myelosuppression, which is leukopenia or thrombocytopenia, renal toxicity, which is progressive renal function or electrolyte abnormalities, auditory toxicity, high frequency hearing loss, vestibular toxicity, dizziness or vertigo, and then CNS toxicity, change in mental status or seizure. And they have different ways of kind of sprinkling these um, side effects into the questions, which is why I'm putting this in here so that you're kind of, this one's not as important for you to um, have memorized, but it's just good for you to kind of know a little bit about it or to at least have seen it once. Okay, so for appropriate antimicrobial use, we have pathogen directed. This is when you utilize an antimicrobial after a pathogen has been determined based on the results of a traditional culture, serology, or other methods such as PCR, right? So uh, a pathogen we could talk about would be tuberculosis. We're going to talk about it more on, for, on Friday, but with TB, um, how long does it take for that culture to come back? For, for tuberculosis, for a mycobacterium. Terry, you are on fire, four to six weeks. Yes, that is correct. So 
so this is that would be pathogen directed even though you don't have the susceptibility for for that yet because it's going to take you such a long time to get those results you already know hey we know what we're working with here and we did our acid fasting we did our smear we know what we're working with and where this is pathogen directed what about empirical right this is when no definitive information about a causative pathogen is available Empirical therapy is utilized every single day. I bet you a physician in Orange County right now is putting an order into the computer for empirical therapy for someone who presented to their emergency department with sepsis, right? Because you have your you have your bundles, you have your basically like your standardized orders of what you need to what you need to do or the antibiotics that you're going to treat with, right? If you're septic, vancomycin, sosin bolus, right? You already know what you need to do. So empirical is when you don't necessarily know what the causative pathogen is, but you already know what type of antimicrobials you're going to use. And once again, blood cultures need to be collected prior to the initiation of therapy. Why is that so important? Why do you need to make sure that you're collecting it prior to initiation of therapy? Okay, so I don't have any, Terry, I can't handle you today. You're getting all the questions right. So antibiotics can alter test results. That's exactly why. You don't want it to skew your results. You want to make sure you're collecting your blood cultures before any type of therapy. And prophylactic, this is antimicrobial use that's designed to prevent infections rather than treat known or suspected infection, right? And an example that we can think of is surgical prophylaxis, right? There's an entire chapter on SSIs, so we're not going to get into it now, but that is an example of where they, when, they, when they use uh, prophylaxis in the acute care setting. All right, question one. A urine specimen collected from an indwelling catheter was sent to the lab for culture and sensitivity. Culture re results reported a colony amount of 50,000 cc per milliliters of E. coli. Sensitivity testing reported resistance to cephalosporins and sensitivity to cipro. This organism is, is, this organism is an example of A, extended spectrum beta-lactam resistance, B, methicillin resistance, C, quinolone resistance, D, aminoglycoside resistance. So you should be thinking, what class do the cephalosporins belong to and what class does Cipro belong to? Right? I know we have at least one nurse with us today, right? And I know you guys know this. Okay, so what class does Cipro belong to? Is it a beta-lactam? Is it a fluoroquinolone? Is it an aminoglycoside? It's a fluoroquinolone, good job, right? So that's already not it, right? Quinolone resistance? Absolutely not, because it's sensitive to Cipro. What about uh, an aminoglycoside, gentamicin, amikacin, right? That's not working. Cephalosporins. What class do cephalosporins belong to? Beta-lactams, right? Beta-lactam drugs possess bactericidal activity by inhibiting cell wall synthesis like penicillin, cephalosporins, monobactams, and carbapenems, right? So this is where making sure that you're reviewing your classes, um, especially if you don't have a lot of, uh, uh, if you don't have a clinical background, is going to be really helpful for this test. Um, SBLs are enzymes that mediate resistance to extended, extended spectrum third generation cephalosporins, right? And that's that uh, video that I sent you on YouTube will definitely help you with this.
Okay, question two. What is or are the highest risk antimicrobials associated with causing Clostridium difficile infection? A, third generation cephalosporins, B, fluoroquinolones, C, clindamycin and vancomycin, and D, metronidazole. Terry, I can't handle you today. You've been getting all of them right. <laughs> You're doing so good. Um, you don't even need. You don't even need to. You don't even need to to come to class. You're ready. <laughs> okay. So a third generation cephalosporins. So third generation cephalosporins have supplanted clindamycin as the highest risk antimicrobials associated with Clostridium difficile infection. And you are gonna learn this and read that sentence when you read the C diff chapter. So an extra question: What class of antibiotics do cephalosporins belong to? A fluoroquinolones. B, beta-lactams, C, macrolides, or D, aminoglycosides? You can tell I'm really wanting you to know what class cephalosporins belong to. <laughs> B, yes, beta-lactam drugs, good. And why are the remaining answers incorrect, right? Um, Clostridium difficile being uh, uh, basically, um, what am I trying to say right now? What am I trying to say? I forgot what I was trying to say. Okay, yes. Um, fluoroquinolones being a risk for CDI, that's an emerging trend. So that's not something that's easily established. And then clindamycin, vancomycin, and metronidazole, these are going to be utilized to treat CDI. All right. Question three, the purpose of the antibiogram is to provide a monthly report on new and emerging antimicrobials, give IPs another metric to track, provide information on antimicrobial usage and resistance patterns in the community, and D is give hospitals information needed for reporting data through the National Healthcare Safety Network, NHSN. Okay, we have some C's and some D's. Um, okay. So let's just read through it. Provide a monthly report on new and emerging antimicrobials. Typically, for a hospital, how often do they provide you with an antibiogram? Typically, most commonly. Okay, Melissa says twice a year. Yeah, so sometimes it's twice a year, sometimes it's once a year, right? So a monthly report, that doesn't sound right. Give IPs another metric to track, that's just, yeah, no, that's not, that's not what, they, it's not a metric, it's not a metric for them to track, right? Give hospitals information needed for reporting data through the National Healthcare Safety Network. So NHSN does have an antimicrobial use and antimicrobial resistance module, but those are not um, mandatory for facilities to participate in. Facilities have the opportunity to do so, and even then, they're not necessarily they're not they're reporting their antimicrobial use and their antimicrobial resistance, right? But regularly your antibiogram is not something that you would utilize for NHSN. So you really just have answer C, which is provide information on antimicrobial usage and resistance patterns in the community, right? Because where are your patients coming from? The community, okay. To which of the following antimicrobial drugs do enterococci have intrinsic resistance to? And just so you know, intrinsic resistance results from characteristics related to chromosomal makeup with most strains, which are resistant to the same drugs. Okay, we have a B. So these antibiotics, I can tell, this is stuff you guys are not comfortable with. Um, and there's there's kind of like a lot of hesitation with answering. So I would 
definitely say you guys need to make sure that you reread chapter 26 and then you do a little bit of additional um, listening to lectures and um, just review. So it's going to be uh, clindamycin. So enterococci have both intrinsic and acquired resistance, making them difficult to treat. Drugs to which enterococci have intrinsic resistance include beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, clindamycin, fluoroquinolones, and trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole. Okay. Empiric antibiotic therapy is most indicated for suspected A, endocarditis, B, bronchitis, C, influenza-associated cough, and D, folliculitis. Okay, Terry, <laughs> why did you pick A? I want you to to tell me why you picked A. All right, let me see if I can unmute your line. Okay, Terry, let's see. Can you talk? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Because the, the um, infection is around the heart. That's why I would choose that. Yeah. You want, you want to kill whatever it is as soon as you can before it gets worse. Okay, there we go. So empiric antibiotic therapy, so that's that's when you have immediate administration of a broad spectrum antibiotic. It's going to be most indicated for suspected severe infections that may be life-threatening if treatment is delayed while waiting for cultures and sensitivities, right? If you have someone who you suspect has endocarditis, you're not going to be like, hey, um, let me just hold on for a minute. Let me just wait for these cultures to come back, right? Conditions usually treated empirically include suspected meningitis, endocarditis, peritonitis, pyelonephritis, uh, community and healthcare associated pneumonia, and also bacteremia. And once again, when possible, cultures should be taken prior to administration of an antibiotic in order to confirm the diagnosis and effectiveness of the antibiotic. Okay, so. Our week three assignments are chapters 36, chapters 95, chapter 72, chapters 82. And once again, you guys were really struggling today with your antibiotics. So make sure that you're going back through chapter 26, breaking things apart, and that you watch this video so that it can help you with remembering your antibiotics, okay? If you guys have any questions, just feel free to email me and y'all have a great day. Thanks for joining me today, bye.